This is London Airport, and Flight 130 is safely on its way. Already another aircraft turns onto the runway and begins to build up the amount of speed necessary to carry the machine and its passengers safely into the air. In the meantime, other planes wait patiently in the queue for their turn to make use of the 3,000 yard runway. At takeoff, speed is the crux of the matter. For the conventional aircraft relies on speed to provide an amount of airflow over its wings sufficient to sustain its weight in the air. The greater the speed and resulting rate of airflow, the smaller the amount of wing surface required to provide lift. Small wings, in turn, mean smaller frontal area, thus producing the retarding effect known as drag. Conversely, it follows that below a certain speed, there is lots of lift as well as lack of control, due to insufficient airflow over the wings and control surfaces. This results in a condition known as stalling. In other words, the aircraft falls out of the sky. With the development of new engines which enable planes to fly faster, wing loadings tend to become higher. That is to say that the wings themselves can become smaller and smaller. But the fast plane, with its relatively small wing surface, reaches stalling point at a much higher speed than a plane with a large wing surface. Therefore, the landing speed of a fast plane must be considerably higher if it is to be set down safely on the runway without danger of stalling. This calls for a very long runway. Similarly, in taking off, the high-speed plane with its small wings requires a longer runway in order to obtain the speed at which airflow over the wing surfaces is sufficient to impart enough lift to fly the plane safely off the ground. For this reason, it has become necessary to build increasingly longer runways to keep pace with increasing aircraft speed. But already we are nearing the practical and economic limits to the length and number of runways that can be built at airports. While the airports themselves require so much space, the passengers often spend more time in surface travel to and from the airport than they do in flight. The solution to the problem lies in the development of techniques which will enable an aircraft to rise immediately from the ground while its forward flight engines build up forward speed to the point where airflow over the wing surfaces makes the machine self-supporting. And conversely, which will supplement the inadequate lift of the wings during the period of near vertical descent. An early step in this direction was the development of the helicopter, which, although suitable for certain applications, is inherently unsuitable for high-speed flight. In America, experiments are being conducted with aircraft which are cocked up on their tails and are then flown up into the air like rockets. This has obvious disadvantages from many points of view. In Britain, the Rolls-Royce Company had devoted considerable study to the possibilities of direct takeoff and landing from the normal horizontal position. As a result of progress in jet engine development towards higher thrust weight ratio, the point had been reached where the company was prepared to put to test the validity of its theory. And in due course, the Ministry of Supply asked the Rolls-Royce Company to undertake an experimental research project in conjunction with the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. The machine itself to be designed and built by Rolls-Royce. Its control system to be developed by Farnborough. Classification secret. The project being initially referred to as Operation DTO. Later, it was to become known to the world as the Flying Dexter, when at the time of the 1954 SDAC Farnborough air display, a photograph of the machine and brief details were released by the security authorities. In the initial test, carried out by Wing Commander J.H. Hayworth, the jet lift machine was tethered to allow it only the limited freedom of a few feet of movement so as to safeguard the machine and the pilot. But with increasing experience and confidence, the freedom permitted was extended to the point where it was deemed safe to remove all check wires, so making it possible for Captain Ronald Shepard and other Rolls-Royce test pilots to manoeuvre the machine in free flight.
flying bedstead is powered by two Rolls-Royce mean engines, set horizontally in opposition, one on either end of the framework. The jets from these engines are ducted through 90 degrees so that both engines discharge vertically downwards under the center of gravity. This is a favorable arrangement for balancing the device and eliminates gyroscopic effects. No attempt was made to develop special engines, for engine development is a lengthy business. Therefore, the choice was limited to available engines, and by the need to have sufficient reserve thrust to carry a pilot, and adequate fuel for a reasonable running time. The machine itself is completely independent of aerofoils, control surfaces, and the need for forward speed. The pilot sits on a platform above the two engines. The control moments which he needs to balance the machine are supplied by compressed air jets, which are discharged through nozzles at the end of cross -up. The air from these nozzles is led from both engines, and the pilot, using a conventional control column and rudder bar, regulates the airflow through the nozzle. In this way, he provides the required pitching, rolling, and yawing moments. To give us his impressions of flying the machine, here is Mr. A.J. Hayworth, Chief Test Pilot of Rolls Royce Limited. It's really a very easy machine to fly once you acquire the knack. It's rather like learning to ride a bicycle. Handling is quite positive. The controls are exactly the same as those of the conventional aircraft. Even in a 15 knot wind, she is quite manageable and stable. And there's no need to worry unduly if one engine should cut out. You see, the other provides sufficient thrust to get the machine down safely. Of course, later machines will no doubt have a battery of engines, which will reduce its hazard almost to nil. Of course, a great deal of investigation and development remains to be done. For example, the problems of heat, noise, safety, and the design of the most efficient engine and an airframe to employ this principle will all have to be tackled and solved. There can be little doubt that these problems will be solved in the fullness of time and with the enthusiastic endeavor of all concerned with the project, both at the Royal Aircraft Establishment and at the Rolls-Royce Aero Engine Division and its flight development establishment. It may well be that we have witnessed the first experiment in a period that will lead, in due course, to a revolution in aeronautical development, every bit as important as that which resulted from the introduction of the jet engine, to yet another British achievement in the realms of flight.